we face the human melodrama of wanting infinite happiness and coming into the world without knowing what that is or where it can be found. In other words, we have no standard by which to judge the happiness for which, to which we're being invited in the gospel. So this leaves us somewhat <laughs> in, a, in an enormous tension from which uh, human life and ordinary life provides us with many opportunities to ignore or to run away from or, or not to have enough time for and all kinds of, of situations in which no matter what we do, we can't quite settle into some kind of system, rule of life or procedure that would enable us to, pre to, at least in our own view, to pursue the experience of God without hindrance. Because as soon as one commit oneself to the transformative journey and, and begins to strive in one way or another to be to become Christ, uh, to be uh, open to the divine life, the psychological experience of everyone, as far as, as we know, is that it, it doesn't work. <laughs> so we have this desire for unbounded happiness no knowledge of what it might consist of or where to find it. And the experience of, of ongoing frustration so that even if we faithfully pursue a contemplative prayer and practice, we find a daily life uh, as an experience of ongoing frustrations of our desire to remain in God's presence, inability to overcome our faults as we perceive them, and uh, great uncertainty as to how to deal with the issue of, of this great longing and the actual psychological experience of its everyday frustration and our personal failure to do a great deal about it. Uh, some people do well in, in the beginning of their transformative commitment for a few years, <laughs> and, and then it begins to fall apart. And, uh, and, and perhaps continues to fall apart as, uh, as the desire, uh, while the desire remains. And so this, this tension can become quite uh, difficult and quite trying and quite searching. And, uh, and it doesn't seem that this could possibly be the spiritual journey it feels more like a journey to nowhere. Uh, perhaps we might begin by looking at what is this, has been over Christian uh, tradition for a long time. The, uh, the question of, of sin and guilt. Uh, sin is a term that originally comes from the Hebrew a Hebrew word uh, meaning to miss the mark. And so it's, it's really a, a term taken from the art of archery. Now, please remember, <laughs> if you still can, what a bow and arrow is like. <laughs> it's usually aimed at a bullseye. And the bullseye is a dot on a piece of paper or something 
that has circles around it and the object of the, of the game or the competition is to put your arrow in the bullseye or at least in one of the circles nearby. So, uh, so this, this original concept of sin over the years has developed a rather heavy load of guilt feelings attached to it, uh, largely because of the projections, our emotional projections of our experience of frustration and weakness and inability onto our, our uh, spiritual journey so that we're experiencing it as, as uh, a frequently a failure or a loss or a frustration or a going backwards or not measuring up. And, and so to, to miss the mark then begins to accumulate guilt feelings, negative feelings about our generosity, perplexity about uh, why we can't seem to uh, carry out our resolutions no matter how hard we may be trying. So we try different things and, uh, and make a tour of all the various uh, spiritual and self-help possibilities that may be available in our territory. But uh, let's look at that a little more deeply. Uh, to miss the mark uh, as a applied to the spiritual journey suggests that while there is a, a, a goal to be attained by, it's not going to happen all at once. Uh, any skill obviously requires a lot of training and practice and in this case this is the most, this is about the art of, of living. This is about the, perhaps the most difficult art there is. Perhaps you could call it the art of loving. Uh, in any case, uh, if you think of, uh, of one's faults or sins as aiming to uh, fulfill the will of God in our lives, and, uh, and we keep each day aiming at the bullseye, and still never hitting it, this, this is a discouraging kind of process. Uh, we don't really know what success is, or we don't know what pleasing God really uh, amounts to in the concrete. And so with our daily lives, we have our little bag of arrows, and we keep it trying to carry out our resolutions. We try to forgive those who have offended us. We try to be reconciled. We try to keep the commandments. We try to fulfill our duties. We try to protect our loved ones from dangers. We try to contribute something to our generation. And the arrows are flying all around except <laughs> in the general direction of, of the bullseye. Now, as, as long as you don't turn around and aim your arrow in the opposite direction, it doesn't matter whether you miss the bullseye. You can't, no one's expecting you to hit it or get anywhere near it in the beginning because you, you have no practice. Uh, I'm told that in, in the art of archery, you have to prepare the body and the nervous system. It's not just a question of aiming at the, at the target, but rather of, of preparing all the muscles in the body so that uh, taking the wind into account and the distance and all this, it, it's quite a practice. And so when you finally have, have mastered all of the aspects of the art, then you still don't hit the bullseye, but you get closer to it. And so the proper response, and perhaps this is the purpose of, of this image in, in scriptural uh, language, what is the best thing to do? 
as you keep missing the bullseye? Is it to respond with discouragement or to say this journey can't be for me or I don't know whether this is the right direction or there's always some difficulty and even when I aim clearly perfectly it, it misses or at least it hits a, one of the outlying circles. And so this is, this is oddly enough uh, a crucial question to uh, resolve in our minds. No one is expecting you to hit the bullseye right away or ever. <laughs> Rather, the proper attitude is not to feel discouraged, but to try again. So if after every time you miss, the only concern is to prepare your skills a little bit more and to keep aiming and shooting and, uh, and not expecting to win uh, some particular prize or to, uh, or to compete. There's no chance of having the feeling of success perhaps ever because of the the particular goal that we're aiming at is literally out of this world. <laughs> it's, it's, it, this is only a metaphor of a disposition that is, uh, is a mystery. This problem is, of course, discussed in, uh, in scripture. And uh, St. Paul is, is one of has a couple of texts that are very, very much to the point. Uh, he speaks of where he laments in uh, colorful language his own experience of this frustration of, of trying and never succeeding, or aiming at the target and missing it again and again and again. And, and this uh, seems to, uh, can reach certain acute proportions at times. In the, in the seventh chapter of Romans, he says, uh, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, that's what I do. And he acknowledges the, or distinguishes the law of his mind, which approves of the commandments and the law of God and to the law of his lower nature, which uh, is what he actually follows contrary to his own personal wishes. So, so, so this is a pretty classical way of describing our, our experience of spiritual effort resolutions that, uh, that we sincerely put our heart into and find ourselves uh, not doing, or postponing, or running away from, or distracting ourselves from, or starting over, and all the other human ways of, of dealing with what is an irritating and sometimes extremely painful sense of failure, frustration, powerlessness. Uh, another text that Paul presents to us in, in 1 Corinthians uh, is uh, about his uh, thorn in the flesh. Uh, he speaks of, of these revelations he had of God that were very exalting and uh, overwhelming for him and, and uh, marvelous, and he says that God deliberately uh, gave him a thorn of the flesh to prevent him to becoming, from becoming elated by these revelations. Um, so this is an interesting idea, that God will give people uh, 
wonderful graces or spiritual consolations or insights into the scriptures, when they're not really prepared to receive them well, and they don't have the spiritual balance or poise to be able to receive them with the kind of humility that would uh, protect them from self-inflation or pride, which would be damage the great treasures of grace that are being communicated. So what God, according to Paul, at least this is what he did with him, he wanted him to have these insights and graces in view of his vocation. But in order to make sure that they wouldn't be a hindrance to him, because every, every uh, grace can be slightly abused because of our, the way that we receive it. So the thorn in the flesh was designed to protect Paul from this inherent hazard of outstanding graces or consolations or enjoyment of spiritual things. The spiritual journey is not a magic carpet to bliss. It's not, uh, a, even in its in more developed stages, a capacity to, to be able to respond completely and perfectly to God in every situation. So, so God deliberately hindered Paul's uh, enjoyment of these special graces, not from any desire to punish him, but rather from the point of view of healing the weaknesses in Paul's character in which he would, might appropriate to himself some of the sheer gratuity of these wondrous graces he was receiving. Now, whatever this thorn of the flesh was it, was, it was quite painful for Paul. And in his distress, he prayed that it might be taken away. And he prayed three times, which in the scriptural language usually means very insistently and completely and to the full extent possible. And, and nothing happened. No result. Well, just think for a moment uh, of, uh, of this question, because it, it crosses our minds frequently enough in the course of a, of a, a long life of commitment to Christ. Uh, why does God make it so hard for his friends? <laughs> Even St. Teresa of Avila had thoughts about this, and she also had lots of revelations, according to her autobiography. So, Paul was serving God to the nth degree, and he did more work than all the other apostles, he claimed. You'd think that God would help him out in this mission. Here's the whole world waiting for the message of Christ. Jesus seems to have said, go into the whole world, teach the gospel to every creature. Well, you'd think that the uh, God who's all powerful might do something to smooth the way for anybody who's reached that disposition of generosity. Not at all. <laughs> Paul is shipwrecked, stoned rejected by his people, trouble with his own constituency. He had to escape from one place down a basket uh, to escape the wrath of his uh, constituents. He was disappointed and he was jailed and finally got beheaded. Well, well humanly speaking, this is, doesn't seem to be quite the way to plan a strategy to conquer the world for Christ. 
whoever has this idea, it doesn't seem to be God's, at least not in Paul's experience. And so, in addition to this, he's pleading, begging, that God would take away this further obstacle. He's putting up with all the difficulties of the apostolic life. But he doesn't need this extra thorn in the flesh, at least in his view, which is perhaps hindering his ministry and carrying out the work that God has clearly told him to do. So there's a great difference between God's terms or his way of doing things and the normal human way of planning a program of uh, effective uh, leadership and proselytizing and, and all that goes into a successful ministry. In other words, God gives a certain amount of assistance and talents and so on, but never all that you would like to have or think that you should have, or that you really need. And so there's, there's a tendency, there can be a tendency to begin to get a little annoyed with God. <laughs> and for those on the contemplative path, if God sort of backs off the friendship and takes a trip to the extreme ends of the ex ever-expanding universe, without even saying goodbye or I'll see you later. <laughs> this doesn't seem to be the right way to cultivate a relationship, especially with long-suffering people. <laughs> so God it does not take away one's difficulties. He sends you a few extra ones. <laughs> but the he does something better than answer our prayers to be delivered from our difficulties. And that is, he joins us in the difficulties. And so one of the best assurances of a, of a ministry that, in which you've really been sent from God is not its success, but its difficulties. That's the sign that uh, that you really are an apostle of some degree. So this is bad news for most, <laughs> most human beings. And, and it's, it's simply because we're so committed from earliest life to become transformed on our own terms that we can't believe that God would do this to us. We wouldn't do this to our worst enemies. <laughs> and so uh, this creates then a, a little misunderstanding. And, <laughs> and so when, when Paul had play, prayed as much as he dared to, I guess, to be delivered from this trial, it could have been a physical sickness, could have been some temptation, it could have been a temperamental defect. Maybe he, he got a mental disease, and turned a little bipolar, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't say, which has been a tantalizing uh, struggle for exegetes to try to figure out what, what was bothering him. In any case, God's answer was, ah, uh, I'm not going to heal you. My grace is sufficient for you because power is made perfect, or my grace is made perfect in, in weakness. Well, this is, this is certainly a new idea <laughs> on, the, on the screen of uh, commitment to transformation. What is being trans transformed in the transformative process. It's the false self, which is the only self we know, and a self that is basically an illusion. 
and one that develops from earliest childhood uh, around the instinctual needs of sec for security, power control, affection, and esteem. And these uh, instinctual needs become uh, more and more uh, fossilized as time goes on. And, and the commitment to pursue happiness in the context of those three instinctual needs is, is, uh, is precisely what gives rise to the frustration of those desires. And that, in turn, gives rise to the afflictive emotions of grief and anger and discouragement and the compensatory needs for avarice and lust and pride and so forth. So the, these habits of thought and of responding to reality don't correspond to reality. They're just our idea of what would bring us happiness based on the inadequate judgment of an infant who tends to translate the gratification of those needs into its idea of happiness. And this process is greatly complexified in the socialization period from four to eight. So that as, as our self-consciousness turns into a full reflective self-consciousness in uh, adolescence, we, we have habits of emotional responding to reality based on an over-identification with those needs, which judges the events of our lives and our reactions to them in relationship to whether events or people are gratifying those needs or frustrating them or opposing them. So when you think that everybody has this human situation or this human condition, tradition calls it the consequences of the fall, <laughs> then depending on one's religious background, this situation is going to be attributed to somebody's fault. And uh, whether it's Adam and Eve or whether it's a lack of evolutionary <laughs> development, the bottom line is the same. The human condition is uh, weak, distressing, and a program for human misery unless it is addressed uh, radically and changed. And, and this is the purpose of the contemplative path that we are, uh, are on. It's the divine healing for a, a, a divine invitation to the reality of who we really are rather than who we think we are and what our experience of our fault selves has has been. Paul calls this the old man, and the cure for it is, uh, is its death. In, uh, in the story of Lazarus, which is really a, a paradigm of, of, of uh, a Christian awakening in the, uh, in the full psychological sense of, of, of the term, or Christian enlightenment, you might say. Uh, Lazarus is represented as a great friend of Jesus. And uh, his sisters were also friends, and Jesus stayed at their house when he was teaching in Jerusalem. And we know that he loved this family greatly. And at the time of, uh, of a serious illness, the sisters send a letter to him or a message, he's at some distant place, saying, your dear friend Lazarus is very sick. Notice they didn't ask for a healing, but simply their love for him was so great, and they knew that Jesus' love for Lazarus was so great, they didn't have to ask for anything. They just needed to let him know what was happening, put the problem before him. And they presumed he would come, I suppose. He had healed all kinds of people, 
and uh, people he hardly knew. And so they naturally thought he'll certainly take to heart the predicament that his beloved friend Lazarus is in. Well, he deliberately, Jesus that is, stayed where he was for four more days until he was sure Lazarus was completely dead. <laughs> and we know from the story that he had already started to corrupt according to Martha's concern, one of the sisters. So Jesus did cure Lazarus, but the only way to heal his disease, it's a symbol of the false self, was to let him die because that happens to be the only way the false self can be healed because it doesn't really exist anywhere except in our imagination. And so the raising of Lazarus is from the dead is the symbol of what we do in baptism, which is a commitment to dying to the false self and its complex of feelings and reactions and frustrations. And be risen to a participation in the divine life of Christ in which we manifest the mind and heart of Christ as the center of our motivation rather than the selfishness or the egotism or the self-centeredness that characterizes the illusory self that it might be called the false self or the old man. And, and it's this transition that scripture calls the new creation or the, uh, and that we might call the true self as, as uh, the self that is uh, surrendered to Christ and, and, and allowed to diminish its, its, its uh, domination over our life in, in, in the various forms that one of which is our, our inability to perceive the work of God in our lives. So here was Paul's solution uh, or reaction to what he learned uh, or was learning from the fact that God would not take away this thorn in the flesh. It was teaching him that the deeper level of understanding of the relationship with Christ and of himself, that uh, is the acceptance of our weakness. Um, Paul says, gladly will I boast of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may be manifested in me. And, and this is the, the, the lesson that we are invited to learn in contemplative prayer. When, as uh, Richard Rohr said this morning in describing his own prayer, the undigested emotional material of a lifetime begins to come to consciousness because uh, the prayer of silence makes one vulnerable to the unconscious. And in the unconscious are those traumas of, of frustration that were too bitter or painful to bear as children and which we, we repressed into the unconscious so that the negative energy remains there influencing in some degree our decisions, even important ones, all our lives from the bias of the false self and its mistaken idea of what happiness truly is. And so it, it's the experience and the acceptance of weakness that leads towards a, a humble relationship with God that is able to see the gratuity, the total gratuity, of the love that God is offering us and the invitation to enter uh, more and more completely into the totally undeserved realm of God's uh, nature. 
and, and compassion and, and mercy. So the darkness then that sometimes arises in contemplative prayer can be due to two things. One is the excessive light that overwhelms our, our ordinary faculties to perceive the mystery and the uh, and like owls who can't see it in a broad daylight, the divine light is overwhelming and overpowering as, uh, uh, as one cause of the experience of darkness within us. And the other is, is sometimes due to, to the simple fact that there are very few thoughts, as, as you know from your own experience, if you if you have a lot of thoughts, the prayer can be very uh, frustrating and, and boring and exasperating because you can't get away from ideas or thoughts or feelings that keep intruding into the silence that one is trying to uh, enter. So that by not trying or to enter into the silence as a, uh, as a goal, and leaving behind all other goals, one, one actually is doing what uh, the skillful archer will do, which is to aim at the, uh, at the target, but to be so uh, flexible and pliable and uh, not tense to have the, every one of the uh, members of the body that's involved in this shoot to be prepared and at rest. And then when the uh, archer lets go of the bow, he doesn't even have to look at the target for it to hit the bullseye. In other words, there, there becomes a certain oneness with with the experience that enables the, the uh, skilled archer to start hitting at least close to the bullseye. And uh, in the example I'm giving, this is the capacity to do spontaneously in the present moment what the spirit is, is, is suggesting we do. In other words, to, to listen and to respond to the movement of the spirit within us. So Paul goes on to say in that text, when I am weak, then I am strong. So what he, he seems to be trying to say is, uh, when I accept the weakness that I feel and my incapacity to, to respond to grace, or the struggle against faults that continue to return again and again, or the experience of routines that bring back the same mistakes or faults. Or in, in, instead of, 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 recognize, of seeing that as, as a hindrance to the spiritual journey, in Paul's view, it's rather in, in realizing that in that acceptance of our powerlessness, to manifest God as we would like or think that he would like, we, we actually are, are prepared for the divine grace to flow through us as a channel and to suggest through the fruits and gifts of the Spirit how to respond to the present moment and its contents without exaggerating the consolation that might be present in our uh, activities, or the depression or the frustration that might be also present. So it, it's, it's a detachment from all the extremes of the emotions. They may be stronger than ever in, in their initial expression, but they don't blow us away because trust in God, that is to say, uh, trust uh, in the strength of the divine grace that is, is supporting us is 
uh, well, overcomes the sense of weakness. And so detachment then from the content of our prayer and from the, the uh, failures of everyday life is, is part of the way that humility grows. And hence, this seems to be the other side of love. And hence, God does not take our faults away right away because we need them from the perspective of, of developing an ever deeper total trust in God and a patience and forgiveness and reconciliation with our weakness and the, and the damage that we bring with us from early life, whether inherited or, or inflicted upon us or added to by our own mistakes. This material that we feel we so much like to get rid of is perhaps, uh, for most of us, the, the essential path to humility. Instead of being humiliated by the recognition of our weakness, it becomes a kind of ground of our being that, that in which uh, we encounter God at a more spiritual level than in all the consolations that we may have enjoyed at earlier periods in our lives, and at the same time are not blown away by failure into uh, feelings of, of, of discouragement that are really uh, forms of pride that we haven't measured up to our idea of, uh, of who we should be. So just to be who we are, just as we are, seems to be what God asks of us. And with that easy and simple self-surrender and willingness to be changed. We don't have to worry about changing ourselves. Grace of God will do, will do that changing for us. And in that way, uh, we don't fix ourselves, but allow God to gradually heal the wounds of a lifetime and uh, and to grow in, in boundless confidence in the compassion and infinite mercy of God. So in the end, the greatest possession that we can have is the infinite mercy of God. And this is always available and will never be taken away. And if we think of that rather than our failings most of the time, then the failings that we can't help but experience in a painful way will not blow us away or discourage us in the least bit from the transformative process. <laughs>